Now, if we look back through Western civilization, we'll find that in the Middle Ages, European culture was dominated by folklore, laws derived from <coughs> the early tribes of Europe, and that folklore provided a very strong source of legal thinking <coughs> in England that is finds its uh, its uh, complement in the Anglo-Saxon roots of common law. And in the Middle Ages, you had a large number <coughs> of you had a large number of legal systems that developed in the same evolutionary way as the early uh, folklore. And some of those would be things like law merchant, uh, which were, again, an evolutionary legal system. <laughs> and in this medieval period, you had a high degree of free activity, free movement, great deal of development of international trade, of voluntary merchant courts applying law merchant. It was the era in which the universities developed, in which modern philosophy began its development based on the great Spanish Islamic philosophers and who introduced Aristotelian thought into the West. And this comes into conflict with the development of the modern state in each of the major cultural units of Western Europe. And <coughs> we find the outbreak of statism emerging very strongly as a virulent disease by the end of the 13th century. Through the 11th, 12th, and 13th century, Europe had experienced a vast increase in culture and civilization, vast increase in material civilization. And it's important for us to realize how recent even settled agricultural life is in man's development, not to mention how even more recent is man's existence in urban civilizations. And it's in this period of the high Middle Ages in which there's this great flourishing of urban civilizations. A very good source on this is the works of the great historian Henri Piren, whose uh, Economic and Social History of Europe in two volumes, or his book on medieval cities, or his book on Mohammed and Charlemagne, uh, his book on democratic institutions in the Low Countries. Any of these books are eminently worth your reading to find out the first stage of European civilization before <coughs> statism arose. And because there were certain especially free areas in Europe, one was the area of Champagne in northeastern France in which the immensely successful international fairs with their fair courts and fair law were operative in which the products of the Mediterranean, and especially Italy, were sold in exchange for the 
raw materials from the underdeveloped part of the world, that is the area of the North and Baltic Seas. So the great Hansa merchants whose uh, activity spread from the German cities up to the great northern cantor of Bergen and from the salt marshes of, the, of Biscay to the city of Novgorod in Russia. All of the great raw materials, wool, salt, and especially fish, were gathered by the um, Hansa merchants. And in Flanders, you found the great industrial development, the production of these raw materials into more finished products, and then the sale of these to the merchants from Italy and the development of the great banking houses with their branches in Bruges, the, especially the Medici Bank, the development of modern systems of um, uh, transfers of monies, modern systems of uh, organization of trade. And this became the subject of aggrandizement by the monarchs and especially the English and the French monarchs at the end of the 13th century. They wanted to get control of this. First of all, the, English king, uh, the French king got control of Champagne, began imposing taxes, and immediately the Italian merchants moved from land to sea and began going to Southampton and to Bruges by the Atlantic route rather than overland and the fairs of Champagne disappeared. Similarly, the French and English kings each wanted to get control of Flanders. In this, they each were thwarted by the <coughs> burghers of Flanders who were able to uh, totally unexpectedly destroy the flower of the chivalry of these countries and maintain their independence. But the result was constant <coughs> conflict between France and England, the French king and the English king, <coughs> which eventually became the Hundred Years' War. And after a short time, each king realized that they were in a position where they would need more money. The previous system of warfare, which was developed in the High Middle Ages in the 11th century, put great limits on the ability of governments to conduct wars, especially the peace of God and the truce of God. And these set up long periods of time in which warfare was prohibited. And then, during those periods when war was allowed, it could only take place during parts of each week. And so it made it very difficult for governments to carry on wars. It was very inefficient. And so due to the peace of God and the truce of God, wars were very limited, uh, had become almost a bit stylized. People, if they engaged in war at all, would do so for ceremonial uh, purposes rather than uh, actual uh, warfare purposes. Now this was being challenged very strongly at this particular point. And what the <coughs> kings found was that they wanted to carry on war for long periods of time, year after year, and they didn't have the money to do so. So their first immediate reaction, uh, which is something very unique for any government was that they repudiated their previous debts. They immediately threw out the Italian bankers from whom they borrowed money and said, too bad, we're not going to pay you. The next year they found they couldn't borrow any money. This created a problem. So they looked around for the next group to contribute, and that was the Jews. And so Jewish merchants were found all their material goods confiscated and they were expelled from England and France. And finally, the Knights Templars, who had previously been involved in the Crusades and when Islam reconquered Palestine, they moved back to Europe where they continued to do what they had also been doing, which was people would, who were going to the Holy Land would deposit money in the castles, the temples, 
in Paris or in uh, uh, Barcelona or in, in London, and a check would be given to them, and when they got to Jerusalem, they went to the headquarters of the Templars, and the Templars would give them money for that receipt. So they became great centers of deposit. They were a military order, they had a uh, high uh, standards, and people were willing to deposit money with them and use them as a place of deposit and for uh, transfer of money. So they, they were immediately accused of, of heresy, uh, they were burnt at the stake, and the properties and resources of the Templars were seized. Having gotten to that point, the governments had to come up with some new way of getting resources, and that was to try and get their own populations to contribute money. And at this time, it was very difficult. There were uh, not as efficient means of collecting taxes. So they came up with the idea that what they would do is get the uh, merchants in each country to collect taxes for them. And they would share the income. Uh, and this was done by a process that's known as parliamentary democracy. Uh, what they did was create parliaments, the Estates General in France and the Parliament in England, by bringing in France the Third Estate in to join the clergy and the nobility, and in England to create the House of Commons. And then laws were passed that said foreign merchants couldn't bring in goods. Only English or French merchants could deal in goods for that country. And that meant, of course, they could raise the price. And that would involve certain kinds of, of tariff and tax arrangements, but also a higher price to the consumer beyond that, which would be pocketed by the merchants. And so you have the creation of a very strong, obvious interest group in the uh, House of Commons or in the Third Estate. And at that time, uh, most of the members of these bodies came from towns and cities. If you look at the old unreformed House of Parliament, it was, in addition to two knights from each shire, there were two burgesses from each borough. And there were an immense number of boroughs along the, especially the English Channel. And uh, these merchants, uh, representing their own group, were the direct beneficiaries of the system. So you have a very strong system of taxation introduced with the result that you have a beginning of a decline in the economy in Europe, especially in England and France. And this decline is further pushed by the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century. But the Black Death of, did touch other parts of Europe, and they did not have a similar decline. For instance, Italy and the Baltic were great centers of economic growth at the same time that the statist regions were suffering from the effects of uh, the special interest groups uh, that are, were able to operate through the creation of the parliamentary system. And so you have then, through the parliament, the creation of something very different than folklore, namely legislation. And so you have the beginning of of legislation that reflects varying degrees of special interest either of the king, of the lords, of the, of the bishops, of the uh, merchants in the parliament or the attorneys in the, in the parliament. And so you have uh, a growth of new institutions which are on the one hand funded by the uh, new system of taxation and legislation behind it to try and undermine or overthrow the original law of Europe, the folk law, developed out of evolution and competitive uh, historical development. Now, this system of special interest legislation 
uh, and of um, the taxation that's necessary to fund it, um, continued to grow during the succeeding centuries. And so we have from this early stage, this first stage of mercantilism with the earliest navigation acts and, and uh, t protective tariffs on the, all the way through, we have the growth of state institutions. And these continue to grow until through the 18th century. And what you have is a continuing struggle between the original law of, we of Western civilization and this alien product. Actually, it comes in through, uh, through the Arabs and through the Mediterranean from, from, uh, uh, and from Byzantium. A lot of it is mo was originally in the Middle Ages modeled on the Byzantine Empire. And uh, all of this alien law is brought in legis and, and legislation system of legislation is brought into Europe. And so throughout the centuries, there is this conflict between the European tradition of folklore and custom and the common law and the alien system of legislation, bureaucracy, and taxation that accompanied it. Accompanied it. And uh, we can call that alien system uh, very easily the mercantilist system. And it reaches a new height in the beginning of, at the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th century because at that time, uh, after a long period of, uh, of no particular strong rivalry or conflict, <coughs> England and France once again enter into a long period of conflict that actually lasts from the end of the 17th century until 1815. Uh, there are three major clusters of wars beginning of the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, the middle of the 18th, end of the 18th and early 19th century. And these wars contribute again to major developments. Um, the first cluster of these wars again leads to a crisis. The government needs to raise money for a permanent army, a standing army, the crisis quite similar to the one at the end of the uh, 13th century. And so you have at this time the great debate on the standing army question. The great liberals of the early 18th century uh, writing their essays attacking the standing army. And how is the standing army going to be paid for? The government goes to war and turns to the public and the public says, it's your war, enjoy it. Uh, we're not going to pay any taxes on it. So if you try to collect taxes, then we're going to throw you out of office. And, but if you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. You, as long as you're going to fight the war far away from us, we're not going to be hurt by it directly. Uh, go about your business. So the government has to think of some way of getting money, and it tries to decide a new system, and it decides if we can get people with money to lend money to the government that's guaranteed, not by the government, because no one would trust the government, but guaranteed by merchants, by people engaged in finance, then we'll be able to borrow money. So we'll create a system called the national debt with a sinking fund that will give people a certain assurance, and we'll reward the financiers who are willing to guarantee this with certain privileges, which we'll call the Bank of England. And so you have, in order to finance these protracted wars, what's called the public finance revolution. Creation of a system to support the armies by the creation of new public finance institutions. Now this leads to a lot of new ideas, new experiments, uh, without going into a great deal of detail, the end result was that in both England and France, the attempts to finance, uh, to create a public finance revolution, led to the collapse of the currency, the collapse of the financial system in each country. In England, it was called the South Sea Bubble, and in uh, France, it was called the Mississippi Bubble. 
and by 1720, both of these systems collapsed. <coughs> and this is one of the great moments in Western history, the collapse of these, of the public finance system. The whole idea of public finance was shown to be without any foundation, and as a result, a new approach had to be developed. And the people who brought that in were a remarkable group of people, uh, the leaders of the Whig Party, led by Sir Robert Walpole, including Henry Pelham, uh, the Duke of Newcastle, who was Henry Pelham's brother, and uh,